Okay, so hello everyone, to all of you that are here in the room, to all of you that are watching uh, this event at the Kenyatta Blanche Center at the LSE using our YouTube channel, and to all of those that will be seeing it, not live, but uh, later on, whenever you have time in the convenience of your homes, or at the bar or wherever, the coffee shop, where you want to watch and you want to take advantage of these opportunities. and. Uh, we have been always been told that Africa is the continent of the future. It is the fastest growing continent by far in terms of population. It's also becoming more and more dynamic and more and more relevant from an economic point of view. But achieving development in Africa is always difficult. And it has problems and there have been a lot of formulas and a lot of measures that have been implemented. Uh, that have been more or less, and I would emphasize the less, successful than expected. One of them is that of the development corridor. Uh, that is now quite fashionable. Those of you that were in the lecture with me yesterday, I told you that what I was involved in with the World Bank in setting up a development corridor, two development corridors, in the case of Uganda. But in comparison to the person I have to my left here, I am an amateur. The real expert on African development and development corridors is Professor Javier Villeyev, who is not just an expert on Africa, but has got a huge experience in the global south, having conducted massive amount of research in Southeast Asia, in the case of uh, Vietnam, fundamentally, but also in China, uh, mostly around the Pearl River uh, Delta, one of the most dynamic areas in the world, not just right now, but for, for quite a few uh, decades. Let me just introduce uh, him. Uh, Javier Revilla holds a chair in human geography at the Institute of Geography at the University of Cologne. And he was appointed with a within the framework of the key profile area Social, economic, cultural, and political transformations in the Global South for the Global South Studies Center at the University of Cologne, which is one of the best centers for the study, studying development in Europe. He is a member of the advisory board of the Lower Saxony Institute for Economic Research and taught for many years at the University of Hanover and also at the University of uh, Kiel. Um, he, on top of that, has got a rich experience because you not only he, you can be a successful academic, he had a previous life as a successful, very successful pop star. So <laughs> actually singing in front of thousands of people. No, he's actually very uh, talented in many, many ways. Yeah. You had a number two or number one in Spain? It was number two only. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so disappointed. <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm sure that you're going to compensate by the presentation that you're going to do today. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you very much to the Fundación Cañana Blanche for funding uh, this event. Thank you very much to the LSE. And especially thank you very much to all of you for attending. Javier, the floor is yours. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Andres, for these very warm words. And I'm happy to be back um, here in, in at the LSC. I see Simona here. So many, many thanks for joining this uh, session. And yeah, today I, I would like to present some results from my ongoing research in, in Africa. Africa really draws my attention when I moved to, to Cologne. Uh, as Andrew said, uh, my, my academic life was really very much based on, on Southeast, Southeast Asia. I was fascinated by the really fast and dynamic uh, evolution of, of the, uh, their economies. And at the same time, you were able to see how this change, the economic uh, growth, turns into regional changes as well, right? So this, is, this was really very interesting and fascinating. And uh, since my, my, my uh, time in, in Cologne, I got very much interested in looking at Africa. And, and Cologne is a very nice environment, or is offering a nice environment, because you have a lot of researchers from different fields, uh, not so much in economics, but in, in, in um, ethnography, for example, in area studies, 
uh, sociologists and so on, which, which is really very helpful to understand why uh, things are not happening, uh, not developing as expected. And another, uh, yes, big infrastructure uh, tool, which is introduced and which is very popular at the moment, is the growth corridor, right? So the linear uh, structure, that, as you see here in, the, in, in, in this picture, yeah, this highway, uh, which tries to attract uh, economic activities. And um, yes, just to, to show you the team, because what I'm presenting here is based on their work in the field. Today, uh, I'm not, I don't have that much time to really spend months and months in, in the field, uh, but the PhD students or form, former PhD students, as you can see here, and this is, this is just to show you that what I'm presenting here is based on their results. And this is Caroline, this is Jim, this is Fanny, Justina, Enfundo, and Linus. And uh, yes, it's popular. Yeah, it's very popular to use now this growth corridor approach really to foster uh, regional development in many, many places. And you see this map here of, of Africa and you see more than 21 uh, initiatives, right? So this is really in fashion, right? And of course, growth corridors are nothing new, right? So especially if you look back in time, especially in Africa, there is a kind of colonial period uh, where these corridors were basically already uh, installed to get uh, uh, to get hold of the resources, especially in the of the Congo, right in the in the middle of of of, of Africa, right. So this is this is something which started already with the British, but after independence, uh, many many countries in Africa either follow the Soviet Union style of development or the Western style, and both were very fascinating. By, by infrastructures. They thought infrastructures really will bring this big push, right? The, the, the big push to modernity and, and change things, right? Either being a, a socialist country or, or, or more market, market oriented country, right? So, and, and, and nowadays uh, it's, it's a little bit different. Yes, corridor development is somehow linked also to value chains, right? Because they, the idea is not to think or to, to understand these infrastructures uh, so as, as transport modes. And, and it's, it's also a way to integrate these places into global value chains. And this is, this is what, what is a little bit different, right? It's not just uh, thinking about the infrastructure. It's also trying to combine, let's say, uh, the infrastructure with the potential in the region, right? So the vision. And today, uh, and you see the outline of my presentation here, I would like to start with a little bit more conceptual uh, things about what is the vision of the future when you are talking about growth corridors, what are the rationales for growth corridors, then uh, the methods we applied. And later on, of course, uh, my main chapter here in the presentation is the, co the corridor realities. It's a very long name. Yeah, this always Bay and Dola Lumumbashi development corridor. Formerly, it was called Trans Caprivi, yeah, but it, of course, uh, Caprivi is the former, let's say, uh, ruler in, in Namibia, the German ruler. Uh, so they, they, they changed the name for, for, I think, for the better, right? But, uh, and they were using then the names of the places where the corridor is going through. It's starting here in Warwick Bay, uh, which is supposed to be the entry port, uh, the entry port point uh, to, to southern, southern Africa. Right, and I would like to concentrate today on, on tourism. Uh, tourism is a very fascinating sector, which is not so fancy, I think, in our economic geography discourse, right? It's more in tourism and management whatsoever, but not so much in, 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 in economic geography, but it's central in the plans of, of the government, of the Namibian government, and not only the Namibian government, and I would like to explain shortly how, let's say, the, the commodification of nature is, is done, right? How natural assets are mobilized. Then I would like to present you some impacts on, on the livelihoods, which were based on our results, on our research. And then I would like to discuss future prospects. And uh, at the moment, uh, Mfundo is trying to adopt or to use this change Trinity of Change Agency uh, concept 
in order to understand, okay, what is, what is bringing development, what is uh, probably also missing for creating new regional development paths, right? So this is, this is, this is uh, the outline uh, for, for my talk. And I don't know, I still have half an hour, 40, around 40 minutes or something like this, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. All right, what are the, let's say the, 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 the expectations which you can read often uh, in, in textbooks, but also in, in documents from the World Bank. And, and we're talking about an instrument which worked out in certain places. I would say it worked out in Germany, it worked out in many places in, in, in Europe, it worked out in, in China. And the idea is more or less that uh, the argumentation is, is like the following here, right? So the, the transport corridor enables integrating places and connect them to markets, right? And this, this should in, in, insensitize, uh, let's say, businesses, farmers, businesses along the corridor to really um, think about specializing and uh, realizing economies of scale. Why? Because they, are easy, they have easier access to markets and this will then reduce transaction costs, basically transportation costs. And what they then expect is that when companies are starting to grow, that they will need additional services. So they, they think about additional businesses and related firms, which then also evolve. And uh, then you are talking about these typical snowball effects or agglomeration effects. In the literature, you also see kind of evolution of, of these corridors. It starts just with a physical connection, right? This is called a transport corridor. Then in the next, in the next step, you, you have facilities for, for uh, storage and, and then you, and logistics, for example. This is then called a uh, logistics corridor. Then uh, the next step would be, yeah, as these corridors are often crossing borders, yeah, to reduce tariffs and, and, and non-tariff barriers, right? To, to develop the straight corridor. Then the next step would be really uh, the situation which I'm describing here, that apart from, uh, let's say the farming, for example, you have the evolution of further economic activities. And then the last stage would be then if also additionally to the economic, uh, let's say effects, you also have improvements in health, education, and so on, right? So this is, this is more or less the, the, the thinking of how these uh, corridors could evolve, right? All right, so this is more or less the classical uh, theory, the assumptions which they have, how this, will, uh, how this uh, corridor might uh, give, uh, let's say, this development impulses. Now, let us talk about a little bit more about the critical uh, note on, on, on the, on, let's say the rationals of growth corridors. And you see that growth corridors can be also seen as spatial imaginaries. And this new generation of global growth corridors in Africa are, as, as I already mentioned, top down, and they imagine the future of investments, modernity, and economic growth. And, this is fine, right? So this is, in principle, it sounds very good. Both the results, they, they are both tangible. So you see improvement of roads, railways, bridges, but they are also intangible effects. Uh, and they are also affecting everyday economic practices. But what you can see in, 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 in many cases in Africa, that there is a big gap between the hopes, the, really the right, the right visions and hopes of, of the corridor plans and the reality, which is more fragmented, is not so, let's say, so clear. And uh, this is something where, where I'm digging in, so to understand why this is happening. What, and I think it's, it's important to ask these questions then here. So where do corridors actually unfold their potential? Because it's not everywhere, yeah? Who benefits? Yeah, which places and which actors benefit? Which places and people are neglected by growth corridor planning? Yeah, because in, in Namibia, for example, I won't touch uh, agriculture so much, but they also have a green scheme concept, a green scheme program where they want to, let's say, um, um, improve agricultural production. 
right? And similar to the green revolution, yeah, to modernize uh, agriculture, but it's not working out. The farmers, which are based, basically subsistence farmers, are not getting into these businesses. They don't become commercial farmers, right? All right, so which places and people are neglected by growth corridor planning? What do they do about it? And who makes the corridors? What are the consequences for value chain development? This is also very, very important, also in the case of tourism. Okay, the methods. Um, as secondary data is hardly available, you need to do this job by yourself. You have to get the data, right? Either uh, doing, let's say, surveys, business surveys, uh, with actors, with key actors, uh, and, and this is, as I will talk about, mostly about tourism today, uh, this was uh, the time uh, Linus spent in the field, totaling nine months in, in 2018 and 19. He did a business survey. There are not that many businesses. He was able to mostly uh, talk to every business there, around 40 in that, in that sense. Uh, in that time, then he was doing qualitative interviews in Sambesi, in Windhoek, the capital, but also in Germany. Yeah, so these fairs are very important places to sell hunting, trophy hunting packages or safaris, right? So he went there uh, as this kind of closed shop. Uh, and, and then he did also archival research. He was in, in the National Archive of Windhoek and also in, in Oxford. And then he was, of course, exploring existing data sets from the Namibian Association of Community-Based Natural Resource Management. Uh, and uh, he got the financial reports of the conservancies. I will introduce you this concept in, in a minute. Then we also run a household survey in different countries uh, in, 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 in uh, Southern Africa. Um, so he was also using uh, the data for, this, for his analysis. And then Mfundo, uh, he is now working on, on continuing his, the, the work on, on the tourism sector. Uh, he just finished a three-month stay in, in, in the last quarter of 22, and he's now preparing for another trip uh, to Namibia and Botswana. All right, so you see, this is a mix which is kind of, I think, necessary because, as I said, secondary data is not available. Yeah, we are talking about a country Yes, which is, uh, let's say, a middle income country, but has the highest Gini coefficient of, of the world. And especially in the area I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on, this is the poorest region of the country, right? So this is this and, and statistics and so on is, is not elaborated, right? So if you really want to know what is happening, you have no other choice to, do, to gather the data yourself. All right, now let me turn to the, to the corridor. As I said, um, Wallace Bay uh, takes a very important uh, position here in, 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 the, in, in, in Southern Africa and also for Namibia. And the idea, and that was very, very fascinating. When I visited the Wallace Bay Corridor Group for the very first time, the organization who is running these corridors, the five corridors they have in Namibia, they had a picture of Singapore. And I was asking them, hey, why are you having this picture of, 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 of Singapore here? Oh, we would like to be like Singapore. The entry, the, the gate into Southern Africa, right? And yes, logistically, why not? Yeah, so you, you might have this kind of dream. You see the, the, this nice map, also another imaginary, right? So that the, the, the trade flows will get uh, through Warwick Bay into Southern Africa. What about uh, South Africa itself? Nothing, but yeah, so this is the vision, the imaginary they, 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 they are focusing on. And uh, the idea is, let's say, to, to initially was to uh, somehow increase the throughput at Wolves Bay Port. And for this, they, they, they created five, uh, so to speak, growth corridors. Yeah, so to the, to the north, to the, this is the one I, I would like to focus on and through the Kalahari to the south. So they have, they have in total five. And this Australian consultancy firm was drafting the development plan. And uh, you see that um, they were very clear about, okay, where the potentials are, which sectors might be influential in the future, which can be 
uh, developed in the future. And you see here in this area, this is the Caprivi strip or the, the area which in the northeast of, of, uh, of Namibia I'm focusing on, you see three bullets or four bullets, two bullets which are representing tourism, one bullet manufacturing, and the, the other one is agriculture, two bullets as well, hard to see. So from, from the development plan and their perspective and from this consultancy firm, this, this area has the potential to become a tourism destination, right? And they are right, right? Because Patima, Mulilo, is in, in the heart of this national park here. And we're talking about this casa or this, yeah, it also has a long uh, name, Cavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area, which is covering five countries, Angola, Namibia, um, Zambia, Zambia here, uh, then Botswana, yeah, and, and uh, Zimbabwe as well, right? So five countries. And the idea of the WWF who was behind uh, this was in, in first to, to in, in respect to nature conservation because the wildlife population was really going down. But what you can see since this CASA was introduced and especially Botswana was very proactive in, in banning hunting, right? The population figures in, for example, for elephants, they grew up and tremendously. So in that respect, conservation works, right? Conservation works and the idea of, of Casa is a part also to generate income, livelihoods for the people who are living here. This is a really a very large uh, national park. The size is similar as France, right? So it's really, it's, it's huge, right? And, and uh, of course, people are living there. So two to three million people, nobody knows exactly, but this is the estimation, right? Around three million people. Right? National parks are sometimes different than different from, from the parks we know, where sometimes in Germany we have national parks where, where uh, people are not allowed to enter, right? They are just reserved for, for animals and wildlife. Okay, so this is this is the situation. So in in, in theory, a rich, a rich uh, wildlife, uh, a fascinating ecosystem. And probably you, you know Victoria Falls and the Zambezi from documentaries. Very, very, very impressive. Yes, indeed, there is the potential for tourism here, right? Okay, um, now let me focus on, on, on the Namibian case, on the Zambezi region, right? And you probably hear Katima Mulilo, as we have seen, in the middle of the Kaza region. And uh, they were using basically three mechanisms uh, to mobilize, uh, let's say, natural value. First of all, they were introducing community-based natural resource management. We are talking about an area which was organized um, in, in communal land, right? So this is not private land, it's communal land. And in this area, uh, through this community-based natural resource management, communities were allowed to make use of the land, right? So they have to apply uh, for, for conservancy. And this conservancy plan, they were, they were also obliged to protect the nature. So they were also then obliged to, to define boundaries of, of, let's say, areas where nothing is happening, just wildlife and, and how they, yeah? So they have a kind of zoning system. So there was an inner area which is really 100% protected, right? And then but a part of this, they were allowed to also make use of the, of the nature. So they were allowed also to make use of the wildlife, for example, for hunting. And uh, this natural resource management really was kind of institution building because the communities, uh, they were uh, then organizing themselves like, uh, like, like a, like a community, right? So they have a elected, uh, you have to be a member. So people have to apply for membership. And uh, this was really easy. Most of the people living in this area are the members. The members are electing then the, the managing board and so on. So this is a kind of, of institution building, so to speak, 
and, and trying to also empower the people in, in, in these local, uh, in these rural areas, right? Okay, so this, this was number, number one. So the, the, the fact that they were introducing community-based nat natural resource management, allowing the people really to take advantage of the wildlife, but at the same time also protecting uh, the nature. Then they were introducing a quarter uh, making uh, process, right? So in order, especially to, to make profit from the wildlife, it's really very important how many animals you, you allow for hunting, right? And they were, they were doing, uh, let's say, surveys. They were doing estimations about uh, the different wildlife population. Uh, and how the, the different animals were, were uh, developing. And the ministry uh, in, in Dintok is then deciding for different uh, animals, which quota is allowed to, to be hunted, right? And after this quota was fixed, then the professional hunters were bidding for this, right? And then the professional hunters got then the, the licenses and then they were selling these these licenses uh, to the uh, to the to the to the uh, hunters, right? For example. Okay, and then what is also important uh, that basically uh, the the revenues uh, from from hunting for paying the license uh, for killing an animal were was exclusively devoted for the conservancy. So they they really they really make something with with uh, this kind of business. And if you're interested in figures, six in, before COVID, for example, in this whole area, 60, 60 elephants were allowed to be shot, right? So this and, and this and this. Uh, so we're not talking about mass, but of course it's ethically, morally, uh, ethically very, very disputed, right? And uh, yes, if you see this, it has a history, a long history. Yeah, so Namibia was. 30 years under German rule, and they were, German rule uh, was as, as bad as any colonial power, right? So this, is, this was really very harsh. Uh, there was an absence of regulation, and in that time already you, you saw this emerging trophy hunts. So, and also South African uh, apartheid regime, uh, which was uh, in, in place until, the, until 1990, was also using uh, wildlife as a quite exclusive thing. Uh, and and uh, yeah, what, what happened was really irregulated harvesting of ivory. Poaching was, was really a big issue and the numbers of wildlife really were very low. Okay, now this is how it looks like, right? If you are interested to shoot uh, an elephant for a 40, 14 days uh, trophy hunting trip costs you around 45,000 US dollars. Okay, but that, that's something, right? 45,000, including the fee for, for killing the animal. And uh, if, it's, uh, if, if you don't have that much money, these for a buffalo, you get a buffalo for 16,500. Yeah, so this is, this is, these are the prices. So this is very exclusive, really very, very, very expensive. And I don't tell, now being Spaniards as well, I don't tell the story with our former king, <laughs> being <laughs> the vice president of the WWF posing next to an elephant, kills oh. elephant, right? So this is also a little bit strange. Okay, so but, but you see what, what, how, how big the business is, right? So it's really, uh, it, it's very expensive to do this. Okay, so how much now remains in the region, right? So, and uh, Linus was trying to really get hold of these figures. It's more uh, estimation, yeah, but I think it's, it's, uh, it, it's, close to, to reality, right? And you see in the Zambezi region, uh, the turnover generated with hunting tourism is 4.8 million US dollars. And uh, the safari tourism brings in 5.3 million US dollars. If you look how much really then remains in, in, at the local level, you see that the conservancies, and we're talking now about, uh, about the management level of the conservancies, 1.4 million of this hunting tourism turnover remains in the region. Yeah, and this are, these are these hunting fees, right? So the hunting fees, they were allowed to be uh, catched by, by, or caught by, by, the, by the local conservancies. 
The tourism income for the conservancy was not that, or for the conservancy, it's not that much, right? 0.2. In total, the conservancies were generating an income of 1.7 million US dollars. And uh, then from, from, if you then ask yourself, okay, what is really reaching the conservancy members as a whole group? We are talking about 2.4 million US dollar. From, if you, if you look at the turnover in general, this is quite substantial. So 20% of, of, of uh, the turnover remains somehow in the region among the conservancy members, right? All right, so this is, this is, this is just demonstrating you how important, uh, let's say, this is as an income, but everything is relative in life, right? So this, and this is, these are the figures uh, of the tourism, right? You might think, if you have heard now these figures, oh, this is a big influential sector, but it's not yet there, right? It's not yet there. So if you look at the numbers of tourists getting there, and 2005 to 2018, you have an increase, but we're talking in total about 60,000 uh, tourists coming to the Zambezi region. Um, yes, it's doubling, and I think Casa and the establishment of, of the, of the uh, national park really made an impact here. The number of lodges, hotels and lodges, you see also is growing yeah, from 24, 47, now 61. Even after, after COVID, now the numbers of, of lodges are increasing. But the employment effect is quite little. 4% of the workforce in the Zambezi is somehow working in the tourism sector. And if you look a little bit more closely what these people are doing, then you see these are more the low paid jobs, right? And cleaning, security, and the kitchen, whatsoever, right? So these, this, is, this is already a step, right? But, but if you look at what they, what they really earn, it's not that much. And you don't, you have to see anyone in a management position. And also then uh, based on our, and these are the figures based on our uh, household survey, it, it's also contributing only little to the household income, right? 5%, 5.5%. So we can't, we can't say that the tourism sector is already booming, like we, we know from, from other uh, touristic regions in, in Europe, like Mallorca or other, other places, right? So this is, this is still, so to speak, in its infancy. And what is also important, and this is uh, somehow demonstrating this, this map, Yes, 20%, around 20% of the turnover is somehow holding, uh, remains in the region. 80% is leaking out, right? And this is, this is something where you see, for example, Vintuk being very, very important as a, a place where a lot of the, let's say, of, of the money generated in the Caprivi is then caught, right? This is the distribution of the professional hunters. Yeah, the ones who are offering these packages, 18,500 for the buffalo, 45,000 for the elephant, right? These professional hunters are sitting all in Vintok or in the vicinity of, of Hinto, right? And uh, often they have accounts in, in, in bank accounts in, in Germany, in Switzerland, whatsoever. So if you book a trip, yeah, so you have to transfer the money to a Swiss bank, to a German bank, so I don't want to know really how much really remains in, 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 in Namibia, but this is another question. But you see, and if you look, now we're talking about the professional hunters. If you look at the car rentals, the tour operators and so on, they are all based in Vinto. You hardly see anyone operating uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the Zambezi region. So it's, it's, if you look at the corridor, yes, this area around Vinto is profiting very much from the tourism development as well in, in, the, in, the, in the Northeast. Right, COVID, how did COVID uh, impacted uh, the situation? And here, just the selection of conservancies, uh, which we had, let's say, analyzed in more detail um, in the Zambezi region. And you see that the income really was heavily dependent on, on tourism uh, income. You see the booking rates in 2020 were only 2.5 to 5% compared to the pre-COVID-19 period. This is really massive, really a massive drop in, in, 
in, uh, in, in tourism and you see the income, how it changed yeah? you know, from 800,000 US and a million dollar yeah, to zero yeah, in this conservancy. So it really hit these conservancies very, very hard. And this is, is a problem with tourism in general, that tourism really uh, responds very, very directly when, when, let's say, external shocks are happening, right? Okay, now let me uh, switch now to the future prospects of, of, of uh, uh, this, this tourism. Uh, business in, in the Zambezi region. Village in South Alta, I really like their, their concept. Uh, and of course, probably the fathers of, of the thinking are also sitting here around. Um, this, this trinity of change agency concepts ask what is needed for the evolution of a new industrial path, right? So, in, or translated into our, our question here, how is it possible to really create a business uh, in, in tourism, businesses in, 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 uh, in tourism? And they say, in principle, to, to really establish a new path, you need three ingredients. You need the entrepreneurs, because they are the engines of, 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 and drivers of change, but you also need some people or some changes in the institutional arrangements, right? So this is, this is also important. So you, you, need, you need, let's say, enabling an enabling and facilitating conducive business environment. And especially in this region, the question of access to land, access to capital is really cr very crucial or to, to education, for example, right? You, you, you need institutional changes and somebody who is really lobbying for it and, and trying to convince uh, also the political system to, 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 re, to introduce some reforms. And not only the, the authorities, the, let's say the administration, you also have to convince the traditional authorities because this is something which is really also very different from, from my Asian experience. Yeah, you have, and normally in Asia, you have the Communist Party in, in Vietnam and the central administration, everything is clear, right? They, they, they have the power. Yeah, you have to talk to those, those guys and the, and the Communist Party, right? So this, this is very clear, clear uh, and straightforward. But apart from, let's say, the, the formal governance system, you have these traditional authorities as well. Yeah? So and the chiefs and, 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 and so on in these places. And they are also very, very important. And they are also very influencing. And they were also quite influential saying, okay, yes, this business is good. Or you as a woman, well, no, this is not a good idea that you start a business, right? This, these are things which, which uh, we heard when we did our interviews, right? So this, the, the challenge is, is really very, very big in, in respect to institutional changes. And then you see you, you, the third element is also place-based leadership. So you need also, let's say, actions to pool resources, to convince, let's say, at upper levels, uh, ministries, politicians to, to foster, right, the development in these places, right? So I, I like very much this, this kind of concept because it's, it's now normally probably we are focusing just on one of these or also on institutions, but also this place-based leadership, I think, is, is really very, very, very important. And um, in Fundo, who was spending already three months in the field, his idea is to compare uh, three cases and try, he tries to understand how these three places are differ or differ in respect to this Trinity of Change Agency. And he is comparing uh, Katima and the Zambezi region, right, which I introduced you before. Then he is analyzing Big Falls with the Victoria Falls, which is really a very driving uh, tourism destination. Of course, the Victoria Falls, they are iconic, right? So this is, this is something very, this is very attractive location. And also then Kazan in Botswana. So he, he tries to understand why these three places are very differently uh, or in respect to tourism development. And here, I know there are a lot of things now here on this, on this slide. Just the first, I ask him, please, Nail down the, the, your first impressions about uh, 
innovative entrepreneurs, institutional actors, and place-based leaders in, in, in Katima. And you see, this is very interesting. Yeah? Uh, for example, if you look at the businesses, at the entrepreneurs, we can say, oh, these, these, these businesses are different from you might think. Yeah, you, we have a lot of people who are already in their 50s when they start a business. And it's more kind of lifestyle-based uh, business, right? They were a successful businessman or businesswoman, yeah, and mostly from South Africa, who want to stay or finish their life cycle there, right? So, and, and running a nice lodge, with four or five small chalets is something which they can do, right? And it's not about, let's say, making, let's say, big money. It's just getting along, right? So this is, in, and, and this is something which is really totally different from the Zimbabwe case with the Victoria Falls, right? So there, there's limited product diversity. They are really also no experts in the business. They are just trying, right? So if, if we start a business, from, from scratch, right? And yeah, it's, it's complicated, I think. Then institutional actors, this is also very interesting. Uh, there's a disconnection between local and regional and also national actors, right? In terms of governance. Uh, somehow this, this region seems to be left alone by the national government, right? And also there's not this, this collaboration, this attitude really uh, also from, from these these entrepreneurs to, to combine or to join forces and to, to really drive institutional change. All right. So there are some, there are some legacies of, of, of the past, of the colonial time. You now, Namibia is a very young country, established in 1990. It was South African before, right? In the, in the apartheid times. And what, especially shortly before independence, right? Before 1990, now this area was really, um, let's say, a very contested area. Yeah, because you know the apartheid uh, and the anti-apartheid fight was very um, conflictive. There, there was kind of of of, of uh, uh, um, war, uh, yeah, civil war, wars. Many many of of the rebels were based in in Angola which is very close to the Zambezi region, right? And they were using, uh, or let's say this, this, this Capri uh, strip was really the combat zone, right? And a lot of South African soldiers from that time were thinking, oh, this is really nice. And they were already knowing, oh, they, especially at the river banks, these are nice plots. And shortly before independence, they bought them, right? So most, so most of, of the land, is already taken. So this is, of course, a, a problem for, for the ones who are trying to enter the business because the nicest places are already taken, right? And uh, the Namibian government, when they were declared independent, um, or the independence, uh, they were saying, okay, we, we, we don't want kind of, of, of massive problems within the country. We accept what was arranged before, right? In terms of, of land holdings and so on, right? Okay, so this is, this is something which also is impeding the, the tourism development, right? Okay, then the, let's, make, let's say the place-based leaders, there are no, no one really who's popping up and saying, okay, now let us, let us combine forces and so on. And, uh, let us struggle at, at, at Vintook or internationally for, for fostering our, 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 our uh, business here, right? So this is also... Um, very, very limited. And also black entrepreneurs are, are really in, in, the, in the minority. Okay, so this is, this is what, what the situation is in, in, in Katima. And I know I, I'm running out of time. Uh, it's, it's not the situation uh, in, in Victoria Falls. It's totally different. And as I said, Mfundo is trying to understand why this, the, this is so different between the regions, which are very close uh, yeah, to each other. Uh, it's easy to drive to Kazane within an hour from Katima 
and, and then crossing to Vic Falls is also just a couple of hours, right? So this is really in close vicinity, but, but the levels, development levels and tourism are really very, very different. Okay, um, yes. Now let me shortly uh, say something about agriculture, right? Because this corridor also has the idea to foster uh, modern agriculture. And uh, they were establishing big farms here and, and there. And it's a shame. You see, you see the, the buildings, you see the machinery, you see the tractors, but they are just there. Nobody is using them. So they were trying to convince the farmers, the subsistence farmers, to become commercial farmers. Yeah, so they participate in these outgrower schemes, but they're not. But this is interesting. Apart on parallel and local indigenous initiative was, was evolving, right? These non-participants. So they were forming a horticulture value chain, right? So, and they were trying to, to join forces. They had this kind of, of institutional uh, leader. And what is happening is that uh, now this horticulture value chain is evolving and is now able to also sell their products to the local markets, to the lodges and so on, right? This is very, very interesting. So um, this big plan with the green scheme did not turn out in the Zambezi region, but interestingly, something bottom up evolved, right? So this is, this is, this is something uh, which is also a nice feature yeah, of, of this corridor planning because it's totally unintended in that sense. Okay, um, and then the last uh, slide here is about what is happening at the nodes, at the cities. And this is also another issue we would like to understand in more detail. Um, you see the urban expansion of Katima Molilo, 95 and 2018. And this is massive, right? So this, this dark color is now the urban area. Yeah, so it, it tripled, it quadrupled in, in, these, in this time period, right? So the urban urbanization is taking, taking momentum, but the not really driven by the sectors I mentioned, I was mentioning before, not by tourism, not by manufacturing, and not by, let's say, agricultural development and, and processing of food, of food, right? So this is also another issue we would like to understand. What is really driving this? Okay, now the conclusion. You know, at the, at the beginning, I was posing these three questions. Uh, so what are the territorial outcomes caused by the growth corridors? Who benefits? So yes, what, what we can see, even in, in tourism, positive corridor effects largely unfold in central nodes along the corridor. I, I explained you a little bit about the situation of the position of, of Winter, uh, while the hinterland serves as either a resource region or target market. To understand corridor effects, we need to examine who is able to make use of the opportunity space, right? This is also important. Yes, it creates an opportunity. This corridor is, is doing something. Yeah, this, this corridor is doing the infrastructure, the soil infrastructure is, is doing something, right? But who is really able to make use of it? Then which places and people do they neglect? So I told you about, uh, or explained you a little bit about the situation with black entrepreneurship. Yeah, very difficult to get into the business. Um, if you don't have land, you can get, can't get a, a, a credit, right? It's quite simple. Then what you also have, what I, I try to show you that also there is something which is not happening according to the plan. So unintendedly, this, this emergence of this horticulture value chain as an alternative livelihood strategy. And what is also important to, to really focus on these unintended side effects. And who is involved in the corridor making? Who do these spatial imaginary shape the development pathway of region value chains? I think this is, this is also very important. When we think about CASA, the WWF was behind the plans. And of course, their intention is conservation, nature conservation. They are ecologists and this is fine. But what we have heard and learned from, from uh, also a talk from a lady, uh, the, one of the vice direct, director of this uh, National Namibian Organization of Conservancies is, yes, we did fine with, with nature conservation. Wildlife population is going up, this is fine. 
but but we totally missed the improvement for, of for, of the living uh, conditions for the people, right? So we missed this out, right? We were successful on the one thing, but we we did not have an impact on the livelihoods as as we have imagined, right? So this is something which is really very important. So you. So the suggestion here is really to look who is really behind these plans and, 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 and trying to understand their logics. The logic was nature conservation, not let's say introducing and enforcing capabilities of the local people, right? All right, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Javier, for a very, very interesting and challenging, and you're raising quite a lot of issues about development in Africa. And I have quite a lot of questions, but um, I don't want to cap capitalize on this. There are quite a few of you here. So, and I know that someone is already itching to ask questions. So, Simona, will you please uh, do the others and ask the first question? Yeah, actually, I have so many that I don't know how we are going to <laughs> unpack that, but let me try because it was really fascinating. Moreover, just can't, I mean, it's, it's just by chance that to me, we are working on Namibia as well, totally different perspective. However, I mean, Javier, I'm a bit confused on a few points, mm -hmm. and particularly, I mean, how could natural management resource and the WWF expected to pursue human development and economic development targets? I mean, conservation yeah. is conservation and is something totally different. And also, I found, difficult to understand how hunting is, I mean, the problem, I mean, in places like Namibia, tourism is precisely because I'm going as a tourist yeah. and I explored very well that it's, it's one of the most expensive places of the planet. Tourism doesn't come from around the area. Mm -hmm. Tourism comes from Europe and possibly some Singapore or like Chinese. or, you know, mm -hmm. Chinese, I mean, but not from the area. So tourism, um, I agree that is possibly a vital resource, okay, t t for a selected type of tourism, possibly not hunting, because nowadays thinking about hunting mm -hmm. for the planet is something that is simply horrendous. So I mean, corridors, local corridors are something that connects localities there across five countries, but do not connect the place with the rest of the world. And we know also from tourism, there is quite a lot of work on, for example, Italian tourism, mm -hmm. right? We have a very strong literature in, and you see that connection with the rest of the world in what matters for quality tourism. Okay, so th this this is something that I wanted to know if you if you have considered the other major point that I want to do want to raise is I haven't read this Grillitz sort of radar, but Trinity of Change agents in twenty twenty. I mean, the, the, you know, institutions and development have been in the church for thirty years. He was one of the fathers, right? We are always reinventing the wheel here. Mm -hmm. I mean, systems, why you don't find entrepreneurs? Because there is no education system that mm -hmm. functions. So, you know, it's also all these actor missions. Where are the industry association? Or, you know, I mean, you cannot have entrepreneurs if you don't have. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, actors, linkages, different parts of society. And obviously you don't find the innovative entrepreneurs, particularly from the local population. In fact, mm. you said South African are coming in their sixties and putting up, and this is what I dealt with, booking a tour of Namibia, not mm. for hunting, obviously, yeah. right? Yeah. It yeah. was a South African retired, yeah. very well, yeah. you know, connected yeah. guy. So local population, zero, totally. So I, I really, you know, you, you know so much about this, but is it possible to have, you know, from you, the, the reply to what is 
really comprehensive strategy, place-based. Mm -hmm. This is not place-based. It's across five countries that have completely different histories. So, I mean, how 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 you respond to this? Okay. I mean, yeah. All right. It's, uh, it's a simple question. It's, it's, it's not, not, a tough question. It's no, not. No, no, it's, it's provocative. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, we have been colleagues yeah. and yeah, friends yeah, yeah. for thirty years. That's fine. Years, I, that's so. fine, Samuel. Um, all right. Let me let me start uh, with the first. Yes, it it was really the intention uh, to combine natural con conservation with with let's say livelihood improvements. This is this is stated mm -hmm. and and. Um, yes, but I think the focus in the policy was really very much on, on, on this nature conservation. And you know, this area, you, you we're talking about an area which is basically where you have a lot of uh, herds, cattle, and, and so they, they are, uh, uh, so and, and basically there is no policy how to deal with cattle and herds, which, which is really probably originally and culturally the most important agricultural activity there right mm -hmm. for many people yeah so this is this was faded out somehow or not seen whatsoever not tackled agriculture as well as, let's say subsistence agriculture also something which was not uh not not seen you know as i said when they were applying for this conservancy uh, status, they have to, to come up with the zoning. So what areas are the most attractive ones along the rivers, right? Mm. Uh, because you have the crocodiles, the hippos and whatsoever, animals going there but to, drink, yeah. to drink. But there's a massive conflict in use with humans because these were also the areas where the rice fields were. And, and where you've got water for, for agriculture, right? So, and, and, and through the zoning, people were pushed out from these areas. And they have difficulties with, 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 with their agricultural production. We had some years of drought in this area. So they were seeing the water, but they're not reaching the water, right? So, and this is, this is massive then, right? Because you, you, you have, Really, people dying and yes, starving and so on because of that. Yeah. So this is this is this is how it, the the planning was was done. But it was written down. Yes, it should also improve the livelihoods of the people. Yeah. So this is and this is this is this is complicated. Yeah. yeah? Yes. Nam water was introducing a pipe system, but it it's 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 expensive to get the water through these uh, through Nam water. So hardly anyone is, is then connected to the pipe system, right? So because they can't afford it. Right? So this is, these are then the realities. And this is just to, to demonstrate, okay, how you know, the vision of these Goros corridors. And as I said, we have good examples in many places of the world where these corridors were somehow working, right? And they were, let's say, uh, having these positive impacts, which, which the theory, uh, agglomeration economies and so on, probably uh, is, is suggesting, right? So, but, but this is totally different, a different story in, in the areas I, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with, right? And this is, this is just to, because there's still the belief, yeah, with it, just we, we, we build a street, uh, this, this corridor and things will happen. And these, these policies are introduced by the nations themselves, right? So especially in Namibia. Yeah, and another case, the Sakot. I didn't uh, came across Sakot today in Tanzania. Yara was at the front wheel, uh, at the front seat, and, and steering the, the the development plan for that. And and of course, having Yara, one of the most biggest, largest manufacturers of of seeds and pesticides whatsoever. Of course. Uh, yeah, they 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 create a market for themselves through the corridors, right? So it's it's so important and. To understand who is really drafting these these things, right, and and to understand their logics, and this is what we we are intending to do. And in now the comparison now, I think what what <coughs> said in Fundo's uh, PhD is on to try to understand why is Botswana and Kazane and the Vic Falls doing better than Katima? What did they differently, right? And for example, the Zimbabwean government. 
only allows joint ventures with a majority in the hands of the Zimbabwean, for example, right? So they were quite strict in, in, in saying, okay, Vietnam, the market access. Vietnam taught us yeah, a lot yeah, about yeah, that, yeah, right? Yeah, so this is, yeah. this is, this is very exactly. important. Yeah, so, and, and in, in, in Namibia, it's more kind of laissez-faire in that sense, right? So, and this is, so now he's, he's digging into the other cases really to understand why they are at, at a different level, right? So this is, this is, this is uh, this, yes. And yeah, the, the question on, on the concept, right? What I like is uh, the idea to look at, at places um, which, which don't have a history in that sense, an in industry whatsoever. Yeah, so in, in evolutionary economic geography, Often the focus is on regions which already have a, a history. There is a kind of related variety, the branching effect, and no, so on. No, no, yeah. yeah. But but this is this is something which yeah. is starting from more or less scratch, right? And and that's why I I found it. I know, yeah. That's what why I'm not saying the, that the, the founding fathers are sitting here. Hade, yeah. Hade, but, yeah. The entrepreneurship yeah. has been one of the main concepts right. with neoliberalism. Everybody, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. But and it's, so it's I don't enough. think it's fit exactly. Yeah, this is enough. what I'm saying. Yeah, it's not enough. This is yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, it's not enough. And and also this place leadership, of course. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. We have uh, other questions from the audience. Anyone else? Yes. Go ahead, Adam. Um, I, I think this is probably more of a comment than a question. Please. Um, but we've seen the application of this growth corridor vision, actually, as a as a material way of extraction. Uh, I mean, there's a literature that has emerged talking about using these growth corridors as a way of securing European supply of critical minerals, for instance, um, and facilitating that kind of easy supply that otherwise is kind of at risk. Um, and obviously, there's a long literature as well that talks about kind of this isn't about local development. Mm. This is actually mm. about securing Western futures. Right. But what are the spillovers? What are the local effects? I think it's a valid question. Yeah, of course. But you have seen the map I showed you, the plan, the development plan from Oricon, yeah, which was done for the Namibian government. Yeah. Right. So uh, there is also the hope that through the corridor you have uh, this this regional po positive regional the, the impacts as well. But if you look at the corridor and which trucks are, are, are driving on this corridor, you see the, the copper, uh, uh, trucks after trucks with copper from the Congo. Yeah. yeah, so this is what is happening. No manufacturing whatsoever along the corridor so far. No processing of, of, of food or whatsoever, right? So this is yeah, what you see along the corridor are trucks really going up and down from, from Congo, yeah? This is really what, what, what you see, yeah? And it's, it's also sad, it's not that much happening on this, on this corridor, yeah? We got the next question, so yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm I, uh, I'm a student of local economic development. And uh, actually this topic is my center of interest. Oh. So I'm very happy to be able yeah. to join yeah. this uh, seminar. So I have three questions. The first is uh, my understanding is um, uh, in Africa, uh, still they have an issue in terms of uh, economic transformation. So how to industrialize the economy. And my understanding is corridor development is one of the pathway uh, possibly, but I also have a complex feeling, although I believe the impact. So generally speaking, uh, do you still have a belief to, uh, how to say, the corridor development will act significantly to make a significant uh, in impact of, in terms of economic transformation? Um, second point is, um, since I learned critical thinking in LED. <laughs> so I, I just want to ask uh, in terms of the relation tourism and the corridor development, actually the tourism and the agriculture is quite significant economics uh, activity in Africa. But from my experience to go to like a conservancy, I don't use cor uh, corridor, I use a Cessna or a plane to 
especially in that place. So I was wondering how much the tourism industry and the corridor development is related to. So the third question is uh, maybe agriculture uh, activities quite related to the logistics. So maybe my decision topic would be the Northern Corridor development, how much the Northern Corridor development would be related to foster uh, economic activity, uh, agricultural economic activity along the corridor. So do you have no. some no, <laughs> advice question. to me? Also very uh, <laughs> tough questions, yeah. very good <laughs> questions. Uh, um, yes, I think the corridor, alone is not enough, right? So, and and the states really have also to come up with an industrial policy. It starts with education, vocational training, and so on and so on. And, and the belief just that uh, this corridor, the infrastructure will lead to development, I think this is too naive, right? So this is not enough. And the question is um, whether countries and the governments are willing to invest in, in, in these very important additional spheres or areas, right? So, and and what I've learned in, in Southeast Asia and some countries is that the state is, is different, yeah? That they are really investing in, in health and education and so on. So this is, this is different uh, from my experience so far in, in Southern Africa, right? So this is, so it, I think it can work. Uh, I don't know whether this global, um, let's say the global value chain integration is the first right step, right? Because uh, you, you really need to somehow be competitive yeah, with the outside world. And, and as I said, this is one of the poorest areas in the world, or in, in Namibia at least, right? So, and, and uh, literacy rates are high. So I think you, if, if, you, if you think of industrial development, you, you really have to invest in the capacities of the people first, right? So this is, and 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 uh, so I think it could be a vehicle, but but it, it's really the countries have to put a lot of effort in these other activities. And agriculture, right? It's it's a question. It's very logical that people in that area, under the circumstances they live, are subsistence farmers. It's very logical. I, I probably we would like we would do the same if if we in their situation, yeah. And um, to convince them to give up this diversity in that sense that make their living somehow right is is really very tricky. And and the state farms um, they are basically state farms and and these green scheme projects are not working at all, right? So this is they have bad management. Um, they, they introduce things, they, of course, there's a modern uh, agriculture, not taking into consideration, let's say, uh, what, what traditionally the knowledge is in, in the area. So they're not taking advantage of what, what people know, right? So, and they want to impose a diff, totally different uh, agricultural system there and people deny, right? And, and this, is, this is something which is, which is really problematic. Of course, Namibia and agriculture is, is a difficult issue because it's, it's a desert country, right? Basically, and just in, in that area, in the Northeast, where you have the four rivers, or at the South, uh, yeah, close to uh, South Africa, the Orange River. Yeah, these are the places where you could uh, make use of water and, and, and irrigate uh, your, your uh, production, right? But the rest is, is really desert. Yeah, it's really difficult, difficult then to, to develop agriculture. And also the correlation <coughs> between the trees and the corridor development. Sorry? That's the, a, the, the relation between trees activity and corridor development. The trade, trade activities? Or yeah, what do you mean? Because uh, mm. how much, I doubt the correlation between the trees industry and corridor development because Okay, Very right, rich yeah, people yeah, yeah. use a Cessna or right, yeah, plane yeah, yeah. to. Of course, if you are, if you can afford to to do a hunting safari, forty five thousand, sixty thousand, whatsoever, you fly in and fly out. Exactly. Yeah, so this is this is something. This is also a kind of tourism, right? And of course, it's 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 
it's long distance, right? So it's from Windhoek. You know, this is the one of the of the the main entry points in, into Namibia, the capital, the international uh, airport there. It's more than thousand kilometers to Katima. But at the moment, there are negotiations whether, for example, Eurowings is expanding uh, their service to Katima Molilo, right? So they are already uh, flying to to Big Falls, right? And of course, if 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 the local businesses and they are now starting to lobby for it, right? To really get connected to international flights, right? This could be then a change, right? And bring other kind of investors and, and, and so on on board, but it's not yet decided, right? Yes, uh, go ahead, please. <clears throat> My name is Bakhtiar. I'm also an LED student. So bringing together everything that's been said, I can't help but draw parallels to the China-Pakistan economic corridor that's been constructed in my own country. So what we've seen is that even though billions are invested in the highway system in creating nodes along those trade routes, regionally around those areas, these, are, these areas are about as underdeveloped as they go, 0% literacy, 100% poverty, no regional transport infrastructure, barely any roads, no bridges. Um, Namibia is a desert to the north of Pakistan, it's all just mountains. That's where the Karakoram and the Himalayas are. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> and there's no indig indigenous capital to invest in those areas because people, they're surviving on subsist subsistence farming. And there's no provincial or national government interest to invest in those areas. So, because to even gauge the economic potential, you have to put billions in. So from a regional policy perspective, how do you bridge this gap? Like why, how do you convince provincial or national governments or donors that, you, that this capacity needs to be built up when, when it's difficult to even see those, where those returns could come from? Um, last year, at the beginning of last year, I was working at a provincial planning agency. We were working on land use plans in the northwest of Pakistan. And <clears throat> everything you said, everything that's been highlighted, these were points that came up again and again and again. Mm -hmm. We have no money. We have no education. Where's the entrepreneurship going to come from? And the national and provincial governments have no interest either. So how do you create that space where you convince the governments this should happen. Not purely because these are people and they deserve development the same as everyone else, but like, how do you convince them that this is economically feasible, viable, and in your interest? Good question. Good question. If we would have answers to this. <laughs> yeah, 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 you have yeah. to follow my course. <laughs> You'll get the answers at the end. So, go ahead. Okay, yeah. But, you know, they, what, I also have told you a positive story with this horticulture that you're sharing. Bottom-up initiative, you have persons, uh, you have a pioneer trying to convince other farmers to, to get into tomatoes and uh, cucumber whatsoever. And, and they, were, they were having a success, right? And I think what is really, what is really important is to... to motivate to find out these potentials and to foster those potentials. It doesn't have to do anything with this green scheme plan, the vision of the government, right? These large uh, farms uh, and, and so on, yeah? But the, this example, even there, you see this evolving horticulture uh, value chain, a regional local value chain, where more and more farmers are, are seeing the profits. I think this is what, what, what needs to be fostered. Yeah? I don't have high expectation about the central government yeah, in, 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 many, in many countries, right? Yeah. I leave it like that. But Andres, probably you, yeah? yeah. yeah. Uh, I've been to Namibia advising the government through the German Development Agency. Mm -hmm. And I'll reserve my judgment. Uh, it was a long time ago, I must yeah. say. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? If not, I'll ask, I think, the last question, which is uh, something that I 
has it bothered me for all the talk? Well, you're, when you talk about a corridor, a development corridor, and you talk about an international development corridor, the impression is that you're going to have seamless movement about through the corridor. And for all the talk in Africa of regional integration, national borders in Africa remain massive barriers to trade. Mm -hmm. And uh, they actually deter trade more than integrate uh, areas surrounding one another. And you have the area of Katima here, mm -hmm. which is really isolated from the rest of Namibia, which by the way, is the smallest country in population in the region. Mm -hmm. Surrounded by four other countries, Angola, Botswana, uh, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, and probably with very little capacity to actually integrate itself with the others because it's completely surrounded by borders with exception of the part of the Caprivi Strip, which actually isolates it from the rest of Namibia. Mm -hmm. What is the role of borders there? How does it this is a hypothesis for Mfundo. Is it that it's more isolated that Waikatima is less dynamic than Kazane or, for example, or Victoria Falls? And how can you, how do you think that if there would be a much greater integration in the region, not just in terms of parks, but in terms of trade, in terms of flows of people, in terms of flows of capital, that would lead to a flourishing of the area? Right. This is exactly the idea of our second phase in, in this long-term project. I, I didn't explain this uh, at the very beginning. So you have seen this is funded by the German Research uh, Foundation. And um, so it's, it's a project which can last for 12 years. So and every four years we have to apply for, for the next phase. And then the first phase we were very much focusing on what's happening in Zambezi region itself. Now we would like to especially look at the potential of this cross-border situation right, and the linkages. Um, so far, I, I only have some anecdotal evidence, but this horticulture value chain is suffering a lot from the illegal uh, trade coming from, from Zambia. So this is something, so you see on the one hand, yes, this, this horticulture value chain is really very locally organized, right? And the markets are also very locally only so far, yeah? Because they, they need to grow, they need to learn, they need to learn the techniques, how to market, how to sell with price and, and so on. And, and, and Zambia is apparently more competitive and, and the border is still a border, right? And, and uh, uh, however, you have informal flows of trade, you have informal flow of people, even workers are cheaper in Zambia. So they, so farmers in the Zambezi region hire them. So they get with the truck to the river and then yeah, they, they get them on, on the truck. So it's, it's I can't, I can't uh, give you an answer here, but, but uh, it's, it's, not, it's difficult. Yeah, it's not that easy. In principle, you are right. Right, so, uh, and I'm also in favor of this regional trade and so on, but, but seeing how this emerging horticulture is now fighting with this illegal inflow of, of the products, I don't know, yeah, I don't know. I hardly can't give you an answer here. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, just, uh, I didn't want to yeah. uh, just stand, my, but uh, for a horticulture, you don't need Barbies Bay. No. You don't need a, a ship, know. you need a plane, Mm. And Katima is far closer to Harare or to Lusaka yeah, sure. than it is to Winduk, yeah. which is the main international right. airport there. Yeah. So how can you combine that if probably the border sure. still, although there's this African continental uh, free trade union uh, um, area that has been created, right. which is still not really working. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. How can you actually thrive? If you are next to, let's say, a bigger market, and that bigger market is preventing you from getting it, you're right, right. But but it would be a little bit too early now for the yeah. horticulture farmers in the Zambia. Right? Okay. Yeah, so I think it, it, it is the potential in the future, right? But they need to get there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So. Thank you very much, Javier, for a wonderful talk. I think we should thank you.
Benevolent Center and to talk about issues of development that cover many parts of the world. And thanks to all of you for coming here, to all of you listening in uh, the YouTube channel for doing it. Uh, you know that at the Kenya Development Center, events come thick and fast. We, this is the second event we have had this week. In three weeks' time, we're going to have two other events. So we're going to have first Louis Dijkstra from the European Commission talking about the development trap and the rise of discontent in Europe. And then on the Thursday, that's on the 7th of February. And then on the Thursday, the 9th of February, we have the governor of the uh, Bank of Spain coming to talk about uh, globalization. In that respect, I would encourage all of you to come here to the LSE to join us at the Canada Plan Center. And also those of you watching to continue connecting yourself from wherever you are in Spain or elsewhere in Britain or elsewhere in the world, because there will be quite a lot of new events coming in the future. So thank you very much and see you all at the next uh, meeting.